something. Ladies and gentlemen, Larry Miller. Thank you. enjoyable. Good evening, and to begin with, yet another foray into the world of men and women. That is, to me, exactly how the world breaks down. It's not by continents and countries and races. I really believe it's right down the middle, men and women, and that's good. I think it's healthy to know that even as we're all sitting here tonight, all over the world, zillions of people are sitting in their living rooms looking at someone else saying, why don't you leave me alone? <laughs> I don't want to go dancing. <laughs> it's very comforting somehow. And I actually think that I have distilled the worst problem with men and the worst problem with women, and I think this is a good place to begin. The problem with men, men don't hear a word women say. The problem with women, women hear every word men say. And we want you to cut it out. Before we begin, then, a little background. First of all, women have been called the weaker sex, which is not true. We all know the story of the woman whose baby gets trapped under the car and she gets a surge and lifts up that car and saves the baby, you know. Her husband was probably standing there going, oh, honey, look, we'll make another one. <laughs> I mean, come on, we got tickets, let's go, you know. But she lifts up that car and throws it on him. <laughs> or she should. The point is, women aren't weaker than men. I know someone is going to say, wait a minute, the average guy could beat the average woman in arm wrestling. Well, first of all, so what? Second of all, that's not strength, that's force. And there's a difference. Let me tell you something about strength. My mother can call the office, pay the bills, do the taxes, show the plumber which pipes need caulking, prepare Thanksgiving dinner for 30, write address and mail out, thank you notes, Christmas cards, and wedding invitations to 750,000 people. <laughs> Then, in the afternoon, <laughs> bandage an arm, set a bone, deliver the neighbor's baby, take out her own appendix, <laughs> retile the bathroom, reset the clocks, repaint the den, reshingle the roof, reseed the lawn, repave the street, refry the beans, release the hostages, <laughs> renounce a regime. And all of this, while on the phone. <laughs> this is the capacity of a woman. This is strength. <laughs> now, my father 
can turn on the TV, <laughs> open a beer, <laughs> recline the Barca lounger, <laughs> and all of this while sleeping. <laughs> this is the capacity of a man. This is not strength. And by the way, which side do you think I take after? If I carry the empty cereal box from the counter to the trash, it's Miller time. <laughs> well, the point is, women aren't weaker than men. We're different, obviously. We remember differently. We forget things differently. We're very selective about that on both sides. We all know that the same guy who has no trouble memorizing every batting average since 1931, somehow can never remember his girlfriend's birthday. <laughs> and the same woman who can tell you which scarf she wore on your fifth date, <laughs> somehow can't recall how long the oil light's been flashing on the dashboard. <laughs> Neither can I, by the way, but, but never mind that now. We look at the world differently. Men love to wrap their egos in huge issues. Men love to think they're in charge of all sorts of things. Oh, boy. My mother has said this for years about my father. My mother has always said, oh, your father takes care of the big things in life, like are the planets still circling the sun? I take care of the little things, like Milt. I think you just hit an antelope. Oh, and by the way, the oil light's flashing. <laughs> so we're very different in that way. Women know some things men don't know. Women know when men lie to them. That's, uh, it's, uh, I know it's possible some guys here don't know that. You should know that. Women know when men lie to them. Oh, yes. Oh, oh yeah. Absolutely. You, 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 you would best learn that because it's absolutely true. To women, we look like Pinocchio. I'm not kidding. <laughs> oh, it's true. Sometimes men pretend they didn't hear the question. And women know this means he's about to lie to you. <laughs> Every woman at one time or another said to her, her boyfriend that you were home last night, right? And she knows that if he goes, hmm. <laughs> okay. he's thinking of a lie. <laughs> oh, was I home last night? Well, if he coughs, too, he hasn't been home in a month. <laughs> so let's not lie when we get caught, either. As women well know, the reason men are no good at playing dumb is most of the time we're not playing. <laughs> I think there's still a double standard uh, especially as concerns sexual experience. I mean, let's be honest, young men are still expected to go out and be fruitful, shall we say. <laughs> young women are expected to be fruitless, I suppose. <laughs> Which raises the interesting question, if the young women are fruitless, with whom are the young men being fruitful? <laughs> Statistics tell us 10% are being fruitful with each other. or being fruity, if you prefer. <laughs> Which, of course, means the other 90% are locked in their rooms being fruitful with themselves. <laughs> Which, believe me, is fruitless. <laughs> it's frugal but futile. <laughs> now, of course, the truth is that virtually all women will have had some sexual experience before you meet them. Victor Hugo said it best, a woman who gives her heart sincerely retains her virtue, which is true. But a lot of men have a problem with the fact that their girlfriends weren't you know, sitting on blocks of ice waiting for them to come along. <laughs> These men should realize that if society were still sacrificing virgins, their girlfriends would be safe. So safe 
And that if the high priest picked her name out of the hat, he'd go, no. <laughs> <laughs> Remember the Christmas party? <laughs> oh, brother, uh, spin it again. Uh, give, give, give it a good spin this time. Yeah. So with that as background now, let's explore, first of all, men don't hear a word women say. I mean, men don't hear a word women say. I mean, men don't hear. The words don't get in the ear. There's an enzyme missing somehow, and the words just... <laughs> <laughs> just keep ricocheting up. <laughs> if you could just hear the way we hear. Our ears are like shortwave radios that never quite come in. It's always like... <laughs> we catch a phrase every so often. Like, Cars in the shop. <laughs> New curtains. See, everything to us is like a train going by. Don't forget dinner Saturday night. See, that's actually the way we hear. Hey, maybe that helps just knowing that, huh? What do you think? Men don't hear a word women say. And this is not just romantic couples, either. This goes between generations. I'll bet you most of the women here know the feeling of going home for Thanksgiving dinner and Dad says, uh, so, how's everything going at the bank? Uh, advertising. Dad, 12 years worked for an advertising agency. <laughs> All righty. <laughs> <laughs> and how's Jim? Uh, Bill, Dad, Bill, you know. Hey, don't be mad at me because you lost the job at the bank. <laughs> <laughs> men don't hear a word women say. Men listen sometimes. One time. Men listen on a first date. Men will listen on a first date. A first date is the only time in a relationship a woman ever sees this face on a man. Still can't hear a word, by the way. It's still just... <laughs> but we are listening. You know. That's why men have learned to repeat three phrases over and over again on a first date. Uh-huh. <laughs> oh, really? And, well, what are you going to do? <laughs> These cover just about everything, you know. Uh-huh. Oh, really? Well, what are you going to do? And this also neatly covers the fact that what we're really thinking is, oh, just one more button and I could see them. Men don't hear a word women say, and it's a problem. This is also why most of the time men don't hear when women tell jokes. Now you tell me if this scene doesn't sound familiar. Three couples are out at dinner and everyone's having fun and the glasses are toasting and the food is good and could we have a little more butter please? And I'm telling you just one more day and Schwarzkopf would have been in Baghdad and everything's going well. And then over coffee, one of the men tells a joke, and it's a good joke, and everyone laughs, and then one of the women tells a joke, and it's a good joke, and everyone... <laughs> the restaurant stops dead. <laughs> the chef leans out the kitchen. A busboy pours too much water. And in the distance, a lonely dog barks. And somewhere high in another part of the city, the Riddler plans his next move. <laughs> I just like saying that. <laughs> what happens when women tell jokes? I, I think, I'll, I'll tell you what I think happens. Men take things so literally. When a woman tells a joke, he'll take it right on the nose. It, Honey, wait just a second here now. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but <laughs> now why would Moses and Jesus be playing golf in the first place? <laughs> I mean, that just plain didn't happen, I'll tell you that. 
Anyway, Tom, a Frenchman, a Scotsman, and a Swede are on a desert island. <laughs> Men don't hear a word women say. And if the TV is on. <laughs> Good luck now. You might as well be talking to someone on life support. And if it's a ball game. <laughs> well, that's the first half. Men don't hear a word women say. Now, women hear every word men say. You know that that's true. Women hear every word men say. Women hear and believe and worst of all for men, women remember. <laughs> Boy, do you remember. I'm telling you, the CIA could save a lot of money on all that wiretapping equipment if they just hired more women. <laughs> and the next time one of these government guys got on the stand and says, you know, uh, gee, I, it happened so long ago, I can't really remember what I said. Then the woman could go, yeah, I, I do. <laughs> uh, you do? Oh, yes, he said it's illegal to sell guns, then he said we have to support the rebels, then he said did you get all the money in advance, then he said yes, I have it all right here. <laughs> oh, and then they watch porno movies. <laughs> Your Honor, I think it was Long Dong Silver. Your Honor! <laughs> she couldn't possibly remember all that. Of course she can, you idiot, she's a woman. Oh, that's right. See, the problem is, Women hear everything that was said, but usually not everything that was meant. This has caused problems sometimes, a little misunderstanding. For instance, when a man says, I'll call you tomorrow. <laughs> the woman, can you imagine? Actually expects him to call. <laughs> it's, it's crazy, isn't it, fellas? Uh, uh, now, the poor woman has obviously misplaced her male-female translation guide. <laughs> let me help. Let me translate for you. I'll call you tomorrow means don't hold your breath. <laughs> so you see how easy this is, really? Here's another commonly misunderstood one. Uh, when a man says, what do you mean, am I married? <laughs> now, this is sometimes heard in the shorter slang, married. <laughs> Now, this means, hey, look, we're here now. <laughs> okay? Here's another one. Uh, when a man says, she meant nothing to me. Now, this is, this one is sometimes heard in the longer, formal version. I swear, honey, she meant nothing to me. <laughs> now, this means, how in the world did you ever find out? <laughs> and, of course, the champion of all time, of misunderstood phrases, I love you. <laughs> this has caused problems. A lot of the women might not have heard this one. It's very rarely used. <laughs> it's almost archaic, in fact, but... Now, again, the problem is when a man says, I love you, the woman will think, strange as it may seem, oh, he loves me. <laughs> Nothing could be further from the truth. <laughs> Again, the problem is, when a woman says, I love you, she means, I love you. When a man says it, he means, now will you go to bed with me. So. <laughs> I think you can detect the common thread running through all these. Now, by the way, I know a lot of the women are thinking, oh, wait a minute, so this means men are just hypocrites and liars. But that's one way to look at it, all right. Yeah, yeah. But there's, a, there's an entirely different way to look at it, though. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, it's a sad truth, isn't it? You know, um, men are fools. Not all men, though.
it's said, isn't it? Well, I'll tell you one thing we do share, especially in our generation. We're not adults. I mean, we never grew up. Look at us. We're not like our parents or grandparents. I mean, adults, for goodness sake. Adults. Does anyone here have the slightest idea what they're doing? <laughs> adults, come on. We, we all look in that mirror in the morning, brushing the teeth, just... I'm lost. <laughs> I have no idea what's going on. I, uh, I bought these shoes. Other than that, I'm out of it completely. I, uh, it's all a charade. I, adults. It's worse with men because we think we know what we're doing. We don't. Men look like they do sometimes. When men get the suit and the briefcase happening, we kind of look like we know what's going on. That, you know, <laughs> hiya, Bill. <laughs> you know, that looks pretty good for a second, doesn't it? You know. Of course, when we get together, it's just like, do you have any idea what's happening? <laughs> I thought you could help me, yeah. <laughs> well, you bought those shoes, didn't you? I... <laughs> well, I'll check with the other fellas then. I... <laughs> Adults. My friends are having kids now, which amazes me. I know these people. I grew up with them. They're idiots. <laughs> They're just having kids all over the place. They didn't even have to take a test. <laughs> Every time a friend of mine has a kid, I go over to the crib and say, do you know I used to hold your father's head while he threw up? That was last night. <laughs> Good luck. Yeah, we've all had those wilder days in our past, haven't we? That's, that's why when you finally have kids, you go, ten fingers, ten toes. Oh. As you know, most entertainers these days have a big cause they support. Don't use drugs, don't pollute the air, don't be cruel to animals, things like that. And I actually found one for myself. And I just want to say for a second, please, from the bottom of my heart, don't go skiing. <laughs> I know it's not one of the big ones, I know. Uh, <laughs> seems like a harmless recreational activity, but I, I, I didn't choose this for myself, by the way. God did. <laughs> That's right, on a recent skiing trip at a moment when I found myself hurtling towards a tree at 130 miles an hour, <laughs> I prayed and I said, Lord, if you can find it in your heart to save me and have me not hit this tree, I vow to spend the rest of my life convincing others not to take a similar risk. <laughs> I think I also threw in something about drinking, gambling, and sex, but you know, <laughs> It's so difficult to remember everything at a moment of stress, don't you find? <laughs> hmm? Well, owing to the fact that God works in mysterious ways, I hit the tree anyway. <laughs> but when I got out of the hospital, I pledged to keep up my end of the bargain and put a stop to this killer that calls itself a sport. So I'm going to tell you the first time skiing, also my last, and sit back, it's a long one. <laughs> In a nutshell, why is skiing so bad? First of all, there is simply no need to ever move that quickly without a plane around you. <laughs> Some of my friends from school took me, I'm sorry, ex-friends, <laughs> took me skiing. Now, first of all, they, being big skiers, had all their own equipment. I, being a virgin, had to go down to the little rental shop also known as the Little Rental Shop of Horrors. <laughs> the quality of the skis in the rental shop is the same as the quality of the shoes you rent in a bowling alley. <laughs> and the difference being, you snap a lace on a bowling shoe, you miss a spare. <laughs> you snap a binding on a boot, you lose a limb. And what conned me into the rental shop, they have three beautiful pairs of skis in the window. Your skis come from the cellar. And the salesman's assistant, Igor, <laughs> comes up from this Roman catacomb of storage. Just, <laughs> your skis, sir. <laughs> Please, sir, there's still time. Don't go. <laughs> I was like you once.
guy who puts the boots on always has this cheerful advice, you know. The, the boots are a little loose so they don't snap your ankles right off. <laughs> I've seen runaway skis castrate a man. <laughs> How lucky for you. <laughs> As I stagger outside with this triple armload of medieval torture devices. And, and it feels pretty good, I put it on. I'm about to go on what they call the bunny slope. Now, you, you skiers know the, the Bunny slope is the elementary slope. It's the uh, beginning slope. And it is. It's easy. It's, it's like the average driveway. <laughs> I'm about to go on the bunny slope, and one of my friends appears, I still think in a puff of smoke. <laughs> and he says, uh, well, look, Larry, don't waste your time on the bunny slope. <laughs> Come with me. <laughs> Does this sound familiar to anyone here, by the way? The old come with me, all right? But I look at him, he's got the matching banana colored skis and boots, the knit pants, the cashmere sweater, the little glasses. I, I had the old wooden skis, they lash up your leg. I think the last person to use mine was Heidi. Old rust colored boots with dents. A third grade snowsuit. <laughs> Big full faced goggle. I look like an astronaut from a very stupid planet. <laughs> but I look at him, I look at me, then I looked at his slope, the regular slope, is, you know, it's all these GQ guys and Coors Light women. And, kind of <laughs> and then my slope is couples on pensions and people in rehab, you know. Kind of <laughs> You know, and, and, and he said, look, I'll teach you everything you have to know. And I, I, I remember thinking, well, he is my friend. <laughs> Which, by the way, is the last thing Faust said. <laughs> and off we go. Now, as we walk over, as we're walking over to the regular slope, I, I should have been suspicious, because right by the bottom of the slope, there's a, there are two paramedics leaning against their ambulance. And they just smiled at me. <laughs> you know, it was that we're eating steak tonight smile, you know. The same smile the uh, Undertaker gets when Clint Eastwood rides into town, you know, that old boy, you know. That so now just to get on a regular slope, now you have to take a chair up to the top, which, if you've never done it before, is roughly like trying to jump into a rolling car holding groceries. <laughs> so it takes you 11 tries to get on the chair. That means for the first 10 tries, this 600-pound mesh of swinging steel slides up your back and slingshots down onto the soft part of your upper spine, <laughs> causing a dazzling spray of pain. You just, oh, whoop. I'm on my back like a turtle, you know. <laughs> can't. My friend picks me up. Oh, thank you. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Oh, <laughs> everyone behind me is getting mad because they're the kind of people with that seven year clump of lift tickets stapled together. <laughs> All right. And I'm just, oh, <laughs> Thank you. Oh, whoop. The back of my head is starting to look like a cauliflower. And finally, on the 11th try, I guess I was loose enough. Yeah, I just kind of melted into the chair. My friend jumped in next to me and off we go. Now, as you're going up, you're also going up. And in a actually just a few seconds, you do have a spectacular view of the debris of other skiers. <laughs> Should his leg be bent like that? <laughs> Why is that good for him? No, that looks very bad for him. 
you know, you're going along, you see they're smoking overturned snowmobiles and people making tourniquets and splints and <laughs> Red Cross vans and St. Bernard's all over the place. And about halfway up the slope, my buddy turns to me and says, okay, here's the secret of skiing. The secret, I, I said, I, I guess that's why we had to be up here alone before you told me. <laughs> Is there a handshake that goes with the secret also? That, boogie boogie. <laughs> he said, here's the secret of skiing. You're going too fast, you want to slow down, you want to stop. You put your knees together and you push. Now skiers, this is called? Ah, uh, the snowplow. Now, I think you do this and stop on a dime. <laughs> I think you just, <laughs> that's it. And he said, that's not all. This slows you down. Then you turn and cut across the slope using gravity to slow you even more. And then you just make lazy horseshoes down the hill in the same fashion. And if you get a little tired, just stop and watch the scenery or even chat with one of the lovely women you'll meet. Well, he had me there. Of course, that's all he had to say in the first place. Any guy will do anything you tell him to do if the last sentence is, and then you meet women. <laughs> Whatever you tell him to do, you know, okay, so I'm on the lion's back, yell. <laughs> I've, I've got him by the mane, I see, uh, and I'm, I'm slapping him all the time, sure, of course. <laughs> and this makes him even madder, I can see that, yeah. And, uh, poking him in the eyes, yeah. <laughs> And then I meet women. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> I like it. I like it a lot. You know. do I, is the lion here now? So I said, let me see if I have this straight. The secret of skiing. I'm going too fast. I want to slow down. I want to stop. I put my knees together and I push. Then I cut across using gravity. And then I meet women. What a sport. <laughs> so we get to the top of the hill, and I know the secret. <laughs> so just getting off the chairs, by the way, is interesting. <laughs> they have a raised plateau of snow, and the chairs swoop down onto and across the plateau, and actually very gently and efficiently move off to one side as they delicately deposit you off onto the other side, onto the staging area from where you begin your festive descent. <laughs> it is the wise skier, indeed, who on approaching the plateau lifts both skis up. <laughs> this in order to facilitate the motion of the chair off to one side as it deposits you onto the staging area from where you begin your festive descent. It would be the unwise skier, indeed, who were to catch one tip on the front of the plateau, causing the chair to move only half of the skier off onto the staging area. <laughs> God only knows what would happen then. God and I know. <laughs> because this is exactly what happened to me. I caught that tip, and that chair moved off. And welcome to the wishbone game. <laughs> you know, in like a tenth of a second, I remember the only thought I had was just, oh boy. <laughs> that was it really, just, oh boy. <laughs> boy, oh boy. He got lower and lower. I was like the prow of a ship, you know, just... <laughs> yeah, the good ship, oh boy. You know, there was no time to yell to my friend, let alone make a wish. <laughs> Folks, there are Olympic hurdlers who spend their whole lives stretching, who will never hit the position I hit that day. <laughs> Luckily, just before I snap like a lobster, the survival instinct we all have, I just lurched off the chair. And of course, for good measure, caught it one more time. Oh, whoop. My 
back leg almost, I would have fallen off the plateau completely if I hadn't grabbed the ankle of another approaching skier. Uh, believe me, I appreciate this. I fell, what would you do? Then stop yelling. And he drags me back up top, I'm caught under the chair. The, the operator had to stop the whole lift. People are dangling behind me. I'm making friends all over the place. The skis are off, I'm clutching them like a baby. I crawl out underneath, my friend is at the edge of the slope, goggles down, ready to take off. I go over there like a maniac now. I said, what's wrong with you? Don't leave me here. And he's like, shh, shh, shh. take it easy, take it easy. You'll be all right, you know the secret. <laughs> he just takes off. <laughs> I'm standing there holding these skis, and finally it dawns on me. I just, well, I'm at the edge of the slope. I take a little look. And, and I realize, why, why, this isn't a slope at all. It's a canyon. I mean, the thing dropped right off. Clouds are moving below you. You see, it's like that. Up, I turned around. There was the top of the mountain right there, the top of the mountain right behind me, and around it, was a circle of stars and the word paramount. <laughs> I look over, the operator's looking at me and I just kind of gave him a... <laughs> and he gave me a... <laughs> I took all the stuff off to the side under where the trees started and I'm starting to put it on again. People about 50 feet away getting off the chairs again. And I put the first ski on and I hear the... Psst. In the trees, it's a goat. <laughs> I'm not exactly Jeremiah Johnson, so I, I just kind of started to go. And the goat went, <laughs> which is not easy for a goat to do, by the way. It was more like a, <laughs> but I got the point. He comes over, he's looking at me, I'm looking at him. He says, uh, what are those, rented? And I said, yeah. And he just nodded and he's standing there and he's looking around and I went back to putting the stuff on and then he said, you know what's always puzzled me? And I said, what's that? And he said, well see, we have to be up here. <laughs> I mean, this is it for us. But we like it. You know, we're made for it. We got the sharp hooves cut right into the snow. And I said, I bet they do. He said, oh, yeah, cut right in. <laughs> he said, I always wondered why you guys come up here. I know you love to do it. We've got tapes of a lot of you. We love to show them at parties. And, you know. <laughs> and I reflected on that for a moment. And then he said, in fact, no offense, but I'm, I'm kind of sorry I'm not taping you. <laughs> And I said, no offense taken, but you see, you might not like that tape very much, Mr. Goat, because I know the secret. As my good friend, Mephistopheles, just pointed out to me, all I have to do is put my knees together and push, then I cut across using gravity, and then I meet women. And he said, whatever. So we exchanged addresses, and he wandered back off into the trees, and and I started skiing. And that's all you have to do. You're at the edge of the slope, you just lean forward, and <whistles> you're skiing. <laughs> oh, you're skiing. <laughs> In about three seconds, you're going Mach 1. <laughs> <laughs> Trees are a blur. <laughs> just went shooting past these two guys. <laughs> There's something you don't see every day. <laughs> he's very good. <laughs> I think he's crying. <laughs> I'm just... <laughs> the trees suddenly vanished. I think I was going so fast, I went back in time. I really do. <laughs> the trees vanished and suddenly there were visions. Over there, there's Teddy Roosevelt making a speech and there's Washington crossing the Delaware and they all tip their hats at me. 
and there's Roman soldiers marching, and I'm just, ah! <laughs> now, I don't remember actually seeing the bump I hit. <laughs> I just know that I hit it because one second the roar was deafening. <laughs> Next second I was <laughs> soaring up and up. Ah! I went up and up. I went past a flock of birds. <laughs> Did you know that birds can laugh? and higher and suddenly the fear and the panic and the screaming left me and a sense of peace came over me and I I saw a light, a white light <laughs> such as I had never seen before and, and a voice came out of the light and said come to the light and I said okay <laughs> and I saw some of my relatives who had passed away leaning out to meet me, not my favorite relatives but even so there they were and I went to the light, I went into the light, and as I reached out a gloved hand with the pole still dangling from it, one of my uncles leaned out and said, oh, if those are rented, you gotta take them back. <laughs> and the screaming and the panic and the fear returned and I shot back past the birds. <laughs> I think one of them made a crack about oil spills, I can't really remember. And I hit the slope at the same speed at which I'd left. <laughs> Just in time to break through the clouds under the longest vertical drop anywhere in the solar system. Now, just to recap. <laughs> All of this, the rental shop, the chairlift, the secret, the goat, the white light. <laughs> All of this is happening on the outside. But on the inside, I'm thinking. Well, this is my first time skiing. I'm going too fast. <laughs>
judging the distance and the vector and doing the, doing the calculations very quickly in my head, realizing it would be the last thing I'd ever do very quickly in my head. <laughs> I realized I was 1.3 seconds away from hitting an old growth sequoia at a lovely round 750 miles an hour. <laughs> and then suddenly I saw visions again, this time not of history, this time it was me, there I was, 16, winning the state wrestling championship, and there I was, making love with my cheerleader girlfriend, and there I was, valedictorian, and that's when I knew I was going to be all right. Because none of these things ever happened to me in high school. <laughs> So I knew it wasn't my life flashing in front of my eyes. <laughs> and I, I knew I'd be okay. <laughs> I had seen a vision of myself carrying a keg of Clearasil. <laughs> then I would have worried. And now the, tr the tree came back into my vision and now on the outside I'm ah! And on the inside I'm ah! A perfect synchronicity of mind and body. And I hit it. I, I hit it. When you hit something that hard and fast, the only thing you ever need to say is, I hit it. <laughs> Did you hit the tree? Yes, I, I hit the tree. In a very odd way, though, I hit the tree because, like a cartoon, my legs wanted to go around it. <laughs> and they tried. And my arms agreed with the legs, and they tried to go around. My head was helping. My head tried to reason with the tree. I heard myself saying, my parents have aluminum siding. I don't even, you know. <laughs> it, was no good. it was no good because the body wouldn't try anything. My body just said, watch this. <laughs> and I hit it blango. I hit that tree. I, I was so dazed, I didn't even realize. I, I bounced off a little. I didn't even realize it had turned me the other way, back down the slope towards the other side of trees. <laughs> Woke up just in time, and ah, you know, I flunked to a job. <coughs> Nothing helped at all, you know. And now I'm going down the hill like a pinball. <laughs> Finally, on the 11th tree, once again, I was loose enough. <laughs> from the back, you know, I look like, like an apple pan Betty, and, you know, from the front, I'm starting to look like Max Schmeling now. And, and I'm, I was loose enough so that I did what all beginning skiers do, which is sit. You sit. You purposely sit. And now you go for a thousand yards on your wallet. <laughs> they can plant corn in back of you now. They. <laughs> Two rows. <laughs> Fertilized. Of course, as you go, you leave a very neat trail of skis, poles, boots, gloves, right at the whole hill. But you know what? I was slowing down. And do you know what? I stopped. And do you know what? The good news didn't end there. Because I was about to meet my first woman. True, it was a surprise for both of us. When she came rocketing off that side trail, And the conversation was brief. <laughs> My part consisted of... <laughs> and hers consisted of a very short, pungent phrase <laughs> indicating she had obviously mistaken me for Oedipus. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, that's it, you're correct. <laughs> Luckily, she was so good, she leapt over me. She did a split at the last second, right over my head. I lost hair. Sadly, there was no chance to see if I'd return the favor. Now you get up, now you're mad. I'm all alone on the slope. My equipment is a half mile behind me. Now you're like. Let's go skiing. <laughs> the 
only one who would help me out. You see him all over the slopes. Five-year-old kid. <laughs> Expert in skiers. The parents start him skiing when he's a fetus. They get him little ones. <laughs> the kid's good. Gathers up all my stuff, goes over to where I am, and pulls one of these. Are you okay? <laughs> now, here's what's happening. I'm making it down this hill every half mile. Why? I get the equipment on, start to ski, can't stop. <laughs> Hit 11 trees, back down on the wallet, leave my equipment in a trail, gotta wait for the kid to come back. <laughs> By the way, after like 100 trees, I think I was actually beginning to enjoy it. Because it wasn't killing me. I felt like De Niro in Raging Bull. You never got me down, Ray. <laughs> it wasn't killing me. I was getting bold. I wasn't even holding my hands up anymore. I was going right into the trees. My parents have a log cabin. <coughs> yes, I know. <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead, you, <coughs> you bastard. You ever start going backwards by mistake? There's a nice surprise. <laughs> You're putting your equipment back on facing uphill. You don't realize till it's too late. You <coughs> oh, Christ. Backwards down the hill now. Past those same two guys. Now, there's another thing you don't see a lot. I'm telling you, he's good. You know, you're right. What's he yelling? Something about drinking, gambling, and sex. I don't know. And past my friends. I didn't even realize this has all been a joke on me. That morning, my friends were like, look, Larry's never been skiing before. Take him up a big hill. It'll be funny. <laughs> He'll get hurt real bad. <laughs> this is their conversation waiting for me to appear. Look, I've been gone a long time. We don't want him to die. You were the one who took him up the hill. Then why don't you... <laughs> Did you hear that? <laughs> no, it wasn't human. And in the distance, you hear. <laughs> Over the crest on one ski with the poles flying. <laughs> right into space. With the kid right behind me. <laughs> and the two guys are back again. Now he's giving lessons. <laughs> he's unbelievable. My friends are all yelling, sit down, Larry, sit down, sit down, sit down. This much I already knew. Back down on the wall. It didn't matter anyway. I slid the last distance, slid right into the patio. You ever seen a hundred people go? What do you think? The one woman I hit, the same woman from the slope, now has a tray of coffee cups. I tried to jump over her head. We both lost hair. At the same time, <laughs> both go to the hospital. She sues me, I sue my friends, my friends sue the kid for no damn reason. <laughs> the only permanent damage was now I have a shelf in my left cheek <laughs> from the wallet. It's not so bad, really. In the shower, I can hold the soap now, so. Three months later, I'm back home. Got a letter from the goat. <laughs> you know, dear Larry, hope you're okay. Heard about the hospital, you know. And, uh, good luck on HBO, that kind of thing. You know. And he said, hope you don't mind, but I did tape your run. And now we show it at parties. Everyone loves it. And in fact, he said, everyone loves it so much, you're, I think you're up for a nanny. So. Uh, <laughs> I didn't mind anyway, I wrote back, Dear Bill, you know, I hope you're okay too, and... <laughs> but 
That's his name, Bill Goat. <laughs> That's exactly correct. <laughs> Bet you can't guess his middle initial. 